Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Long Island Board Gaming. In this more time tactics video, I'm actually going to be responding to Anthony's video that he posted just recently, a day or two ago. Why is more time still going strong? So I'm gonna just reiterate some of his points and then build on them, and then also introduce some of my own thoughts because he's right. There's a lot to this game that allows it to keep on going. So there are a lot of little supplements and extra little things here and there, you know, town criers and campaigns. You know, a lot of them are Games Workshop created, but I think a lot of the success of the game is because Games Workshop stopped supporting it so long ago that they left it in this time capsule where it was just in a great place and they didn't continue to mess around with it. It stayed where it was. Was it a perfect game? No. Did it need to be a perfect game? No, because like Anthony says, it's more time. It's, you know, crazy shit happens and who gives a crap? As long as you're having fun and you're running around the, the table, you know, that's that's where it's all at. So, <clears throat> if GW continued to play with it like they do with Fantasy and they tried to make it profitable, yeah, it would have probably gone downhill. But you know what? It could have possibly been ten times better if they kept putting out Town Criers. And for those of you who don't know what the Town Criers are... They were like either part of the White Dwarf or before they were White Dwarfs, they were just little uh, little magazines or little articles that just fed more rules and concepts into the game. And that goes into my next point. There's a lot of things in Mordheim, and it's easy to omit things. So when you're playing Warhammer Fantasy or any war game, most of the rules, you can't just be like, well, you know what, I don't like that rule, we're going to omit it. I don't like shooting in two ranks, I'm going to omit that. You know, I don't like that you can you know, shoot five guys per level in a building. I'm going to admit that. I don't like that, you know, flank charge. And you can't just omit rules. We're like, more time, you can. I've done campaigns where I take out the, the soft cover more time book and I say, here's the rules and that's it. We've also done some campaigns where we say, anything's a go. Anything. Anything in terms of GW, Town Crier products and, you know, experimental and official stuff by Games Workshop. Fan-based stuff we try to stay away from, as I recommend you do, unless it's, you know, really, really well thought and really, really fair and everyone agrees on it. But there's a lot of things out there. So when we play, like, a very, very strict, quote-unquote, strict campaign, we stick to the core rules. But we've done some where we're just like, you know what, beer and pretzels, let's have some fun, you know. I've got guys that are like, you know what, I'm going to take this town crier and I'm going to do something from this town crier number 22 and it's, you know, the doctor and it's like a 2d6 chart where it, you might be able to recover one of your injuries. Like if you have a an eye shot out and you're at minus one blitz skill, you know, if you roll like a 10, 11, 12, he actually repairs your eye and, you, you know, you're back up to ballistic skill 4, whatever you're at, and you do good. The chart's hysterical because all the results from like 2 to, you know, 9 are like shit terrible like you roll like a two or a three on the chart you just die so like there's a lot of these little things where like it's not necessarily worth it but hell it's funny and the person cares that much about repairing their character's arm or leg or something or their eye or you know their old battle wound that you know what we want to use that town crier and that you know little supplement let's do it so there's a lot of stuff that you can omit and you know or or put in and it could be at any point during the campaign. So I've done some campaigns where it's going, it's going, and we needed something just a little extra. So we pull out a town crier or, you know, we pull up, you know, scenarios from a different set, whether it's uh, Lustria or um, Empire and Flames or, or whichever set of rules or scenarios you want to pick from. And you can just completely shift the direction of your ongoing campaign or if you're looking to start a new one or end one, you can just swift, uh, switch gears very easily without an issue. If there are certain rules that are making the game a little broken or unfun, then you can omit them on the spot. All right, starting next game, we're not going to allow people to use this certain weapon because, you know, it's not in the original book and it's kind of stupid. So then you know what? People can sell it, get their gold back. Like, it's very easy to fix as you go if you have a loose gaming group. If you've got, you know, a little tournament that you're going to do, I've, I've done more time tournaments, which is very interesting. I've done that at the LGS where you do three games and everyone does the same scenario and you try to do the best you can. At the end of the day, it's you know very weird because each table set up different. Everyone's got different advantages, but who cares? Everyone's just happy that they can do a three game tournament and their guys level up and you know it's 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 fun. So it's very easy to omit or add in rules, which I think is awesome. If I could do that for 8th edition, the rules that I don't like and the rules I do like, I mean, I would love to take some 7th edition of stuff and apply it to 8th, but it's just not, it's not there, you know? So, 
like for example, in seventh edition, if you charged, you got to strike first. That would be great. I'd love to add that in. Different variable, different you know element, but there's just things that you can omit and add and subtract. So there's so many things. That's the next point I want to say. There's just so many things. Like Anthony was saying, you know, you roll on charts. I'm still rolling on charts I have never really read, especially on exploration where it's like I rolled triples, doubles, you know, quadruples. I rolled five of a kind. You know, I get to go do something crazy or for some reason he got to eat a baby, which I don't remember that chart anywhere. But hell, if there's a chart where you get to eat a baby, then so be it. It's more time. Uh, the next point I want to make, and this is, you know, might ho hit home with some people. It hit homes with me because I'm not really into these games, but World of Warcraft and other MMORPGs, it's very predictable, and it's, you know, the same thing over and over. You can only play the game a few times, which people might say I'm totally wrong. You can play World of Warcraft forever, but <laughs> there's restrictions. It's confined, where at the end of the day, it's, you know, very cookie cutter in terms of what you can do where in more time it's a lot more open-ended if you've got a gaming group where you're like well he wants to go knock that ladder down and everyone says okay we'll let him do it it's a lot more sandbox it's a lot more of like a minecraft where you can pick and choose and add in some tracks and just make it fun and a game that allows you to add elements to make it fun is great you can't do that in warhammer fantasy because the game is like two to three hours long. You spend all this time prepping and putting miles together and getting them on the battlefield. That Any elements of added fun usually only adds fun to one side or the other. That's why some of that funky terrain where it's like, you know, the, the tower zaps the closest target. It plays such a big role in winning and losing the game. And fantasy just has that more competitive edge that, you know, you want to win. You want to, you know, do the best you can in that game. And for a while, I've always been for the fun fantasy games. But as I started getting into GTs and stuff, I wanted to practice more games where it's like, no, all mundane terrain, nothing fun, none of this crazy crap. And that's where it started to lose its fun factor, which, you know, every once in a while, I'll go back to small games and we'll roll up the fancy terrain and all that crazy stuff. But more time always has it. Uh, I don't know if Anthony has been using the random happenings chart. So if you guys don't do that, look it up. It's random happenings. Just Google it. You find it. It's a D66 chart where... You roll a 1 at the beginning of your turn. Once you get a 1, a random happening happens. And a giant spider could show up, or a blood letter comes up and, you know, kills your lore band. Or, you know, you might roll, you know, a 12, and then you have an ogre mercenary that pops up on the edge of the table and assists the war band with the least rating. It's cool. It's very random. And it's very fun. And I like that. And I can appreciate that. Another part about this game is, since it goes on, and hopefully you're able to play a campaign where... You know, each game you build on the last one, you have heroes progressing. There's always an opportunity to catch up. Sometimes you fall too far behind and you can't, but if you're far behind or some of your heroes are dead, you gain extra experience. So I've played a game where a bunch of my heroes were sitting out and a few of my good henchmen died. I was like 125 warband rating below the leading warband. So all my guys got two extra experience, which allowed me to play catch up. So my guys advanced a little bit better and, you know, it was... It was interesting. It worked out all right. So the last point I'm going to hit on, which hits home for me, is the terrain. A Warhammer Fantasy battle table, your terrain switches around. You have different hills or forests here and there. But Mordheim, man, if you get a nice accumulation of terrain, you can really, really play with the battlefield. You know, you can build up, you can build out, you can, you know, build bridges, you can build houses that are, you know, five stories tall. If you're into that kind of stuff, making the stuff, that that's where I'm at. I love building terrain. I love building buildings. And it's not hard to do because, honestly, it's a destroyed city. So when you screw something up, odds are it was supposed to look screwed up. So have fun with it. You know, paint it up. Make it look good. You, you, or don't make it look good. It's supposed to look like shit. It, I think the terrain's cool and the fact that there's just multiple layers. You know, I've got my, like, plateau sections where, you know, you have obstacles in the way or you want to climb up or you got to find a ladder. There's a lot of potential getting to that big city that you want. I'm not there yet. I'm getting closer to what I want. You know, there's some buildings I want to phase out and add the new, more intricate things, but hell, if you saw my Mordheim city from like 10 years ago, it was like boxes from like cookies. It was like Oreo boxes and like VHS tapes and like just stacked on top of each other with like a Lego building here and there. And it was just so crude, but yet it was still so fun at the same time. But now I'm at the point where, you know, I make a two or three pieces of terrain a year. The city just looks great. 
And I mean, I love the way my city's coming out, and I encourage all of you to build and build your cities. Just, you know, get multiple layer buildings, get torn up buildings, uh, just have fun with it. And to me, that's the biggest thing because it's so interactive. You know, you're climbing up buildings, you're going down staircases, you know, you're trying to find the next ladder. It's just, it's just really cool, that interactive battlefield where it's a little bit more personal. You feel like you're actually in a video game, and that's why this video game that's coming out with Mordheim, it's exactly what I always anticipated. You're running through the city, you know, you're you're looking at guys above you that have crossbows, and you're trying to duck for cover, and there's bridges you got to run across, and you're hopping up and down, climbing, and using your rope and hook. The game Mordheim on the table <clears throat> translates so well into that video game that when I'm playing on the table, I feel like I'm playing a video game. You know, I'm moving my pieces around. It's like a chess game. It's it's fun. And there's a lot in Mordheim, and those are the points I'm going to stick with to keep this video, you know, not longer than, you know, 15 minutes or so. That's that's where I'm at. So, hope, you know, that creates some insight on why I think Mordheim's still going, of course. You know, make your comments below. You know, let me know why you think it's still going. And, uh, you know, I'm curious to actually hear if there's anyone out there that stopped playing it for any reason and what those reasons are so i'm curious about those but if you haven't already checked it out check out anthony's video on why is mordheim still going strong thanks for tuning into this tactics video not really tactical but just information and thoughts and i'll see you guys in the next one